we will get started. Hello, and thank you to everyone around the world for joining us for this week's lab meeting. My name is Kristen Abood. I am the science editor at the Human Vaccines Project, and I will be your moderator today. We are officially in the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic. And what that means looks very different depending on where you are in the world. Infections, hospitalizations, and deaths continue to decline in many countries, while in others, including mainland China, they are still fighting against a wave of new infections due to the Omicron variant. An uptick in cases has also been observed recently in Europe and the US due to the BA.2 version of the Omicron variant, at the same time that many pandemic-related restrictions, including masking, are being lifted. All of this has scientists debating the optimal use of booster doses of vaccines in advance of any future SARS-CoV-2 variants. Meanwhile, Moderna says it will seek an emergency use, use authorization for its COVID-19 vaccine in children under the age of six based on results from clinical trials, though the company expects booster doses may also be required for this age group. In today's talk, we'll learn in more detail about the antibody responses induced by COVID-19 vaccines. Just one more note before I introduce today's speaker. The information presented today includes some pre-published data that is currently under peer review. We therefore ask that you not reproduce or disseminate the data presented in any way. It is my pleasure to now introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Alton, a primary investigator at the Translational Genomics Research Institute, or TGen, an affiliate of City of Hope Cancer Institute. Dr. Alton began his research career in the immunogenomics lab of Chris Goodnow at the Australian National University, where he used genome-wide mutagenesis to elucidate several novel molecular and cellular pathways that regulate the helper T cell response. After his PhD, John joined Prognosis Biosciences, a startup biotech company to develop immunological applications for novel, highly multiplexed proteomics and genomics assays. There, he led an interdisciplinary team to develop a platform enabling comprehensive analysis of peptide binding to immunological ligands. In 2017, John joined the faculty of the Translational Genomics Research Institute, where he has since developed a research program at the intersection of immunology, biotechnology, and pathogen genomics. His research brings advances in genomic technology to the study of adaptive immune responses, ultimately in search of improved preventive, diagnostic, and treatment strategies for infectious diseases, particularly those of global relevance. During today's presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. Feel free to use the chat for general comments, but please don't post questions there. I will ask John a broad selection of your questions after the presentation, and we will have about 20 minutes for discussion. With that, it is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. John Alton. Thanks, Kristen. Great to be here. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Let me pull up my slides here. You guys see that okay? That looks great, thank you. Great. Well, great to be here. And let me just start by saying that, um, you know, the work you're gonna see is really a collaborative effort from a terrific interdisciplinary team here in Flagstaff, uh, Arizona. We're a little bit geographically isolated, but we really have the good fortune of working with some really terrific folks um, with expertise in genomics, viral genomics, immunology, uh, bioinformatics, among other disciplines. Um, so 
our lab's focus, uh, at least one of them has been to focus, uh, is, has been to study the, the serological response predominantly to viruses uh, using this kind of deep three-dimensional approach. And the three dimensions I'm talking about here are breadth, number one, looking at many, many targets at the same time. Resolution, number two, looking at these targets um, at very high resolution down to the single amino acid level. And across time, number three, um, using longitudinal sampling strategies to study the evolution of these responses. We have projects where we're looking across the complete human environment. Um, for today's purposes, of course, we'll focus on, on the SARS-CoV-2, but also some of the other members of the coronavirus family. The technology platform upon which this is built is depicted here, and I was involved in, in the development of this um, in biotech. This can be thought of as an analog to phage display. And really what we do is we take a, um, a set of content of interest, and this could be the, the complete human environment, it could be the bacterium, it could be some large antigenic potential space. And we design a library of, of linear peptides, um, and this platform lets us do this at ranges from 15 to 64 amino acids or, and potentially more. And then using this, this technique, we were able to generate a library of DNA barcoded peptides using a single highly multiplex synthesis reaction and run assays on that, on that pool using the same kind of highly multiplex system. This takes advantage of um, an intramolecular coupling event. And so we start with a, a library of DNA templates designed to cover the, the content of interest. And then we perform a fully in vitro process of transcription, ligation, translation, reverse transcription to generate a library of DNA barcoded peptides uh, that are, in which case each of these um, uh, links is made as a covalent bond. And so because of this intramolecular system where the pyromycin is able to become attached to the growing peptide at the end, this can be done in a single tube uh, in a way that's highly efficient. Of course, this then becomes a substrate for highly multiplexed assays that are read out using next generation sequencing. So once we have such a library in hand, we can perform multiplex serology assays as follows. We can take the library, incubate it with a polyclonal serum sample, uh, and then capture that on, on our protein G beads, wash away the non-binding peptides, and sequence um, after, after some library preparation, the deep DNA barcodes of the peptides that bound. Uh, again, very analogous to what, what we see with a phage-based approach. I guess the two key differences being that we do this um, using a fully in vitro synthetic process, uh, and also that the molecular construct that we're talking about here is very simple and small. It's a single uh, peptide coupled to a single DNA barcode. So we're funded to do this across the human environment. We've done, we've done work um, where we take a, a library that's generated in that fashion, 244,000 peptides, and I'm showing you here um, uh, sorting those peptides by taxonomy across the, across the library. This, this um, represented more than 300 human infecting viral species. And if you take a, a serum sample, you, you see a general pattern where you see these peaks, uh, peptides that are showing signals that are all clustered by taxonomy, each uh, corresponding to a, a virus to which this particular subject has historical immunity. This particular person was hepatitis C positive and we see positivity for that virus. Um, and in contrast to no serum control, we see a, a very flat line here. So we can look at this thing, you know, we can look at this a high breadth. We can also look at high resolution. So if we could zoom in to one of these viruses, and this happens to be rhinovirus, the most commonly infecting virus to which we see the strongest signal. And we can then look at high resolution across the 11 proteins of rhinovirus A and see where the reactivity lands across these proteins across different individuals and identify even a dominant, at least linear peptide in the dominant regions of that, of that virus. So for today's purposes, we're going to be looking at um, the human coronaviruses. So I think, you know, we know from the success of vaccination, particularly RNA vaccines, um, that one of the reasons that the pandemic was so deadly was, was a lack of immunity. Um, one of the questions we were interested in asking was, you know, how naive were, were humans to SARS-CoV-2 before this came along? So SARS-CoV-2 is a member of the coronaviridae family. There are a number of others that infect humans. Um, there are two beta coronaviruses, OC43 and HKU1, uh, and two alphas, ML63 and 229E, that cause common colds. They're, they're commonly infecting. Um, there's prevalent immunity in the community against these viruses. 
Uh, and so as soon as it became clear that SARS-CoV-2 was, was a global concern, uh, we, like others, studied the sequence of the spike protein, uh, and, and we noticed the potential for some adaptive immune cross-reactivity um, based on conservation here. So what I'm showing on the right here is the structure of the spike protein, the S1 subunit, the S2 subunit, and a sequence alignment looking at local identity, nightmare identity, across these four different um, commonly infecting common cold coronaviruses. And you see a general pattern where the S1 subunit shows minimal levels of conservation, but there is um, significant conservation in S2 uh, for each of these viruses, and particularly at, at certain regions that we're going to go into in more detail. So to study um, how the antibody response across this family evolves in response to exposure to SARS-CoV-2 spike, uh, which like I said, is now the, the fifth um, widespread coronavirus to um, infect humans, we recruited a, a cohort of individuals who were naive to SARS-CoV-2 and then followed their responses longitudinally um, uh, following mRNA vaccination with the Moderna shot um, at days 0, 8, 28, and approximately 140. We, we studied this using a 15,000 plex library using the PepSeq platform I described. And this contained peptides that we had identified from previous analyses to be reactive across these various um, species, coronavirus species. So for each peptide, we compared signal across the time series from 0, 8, 28, 1, 140, and asked the question of whether there's a significant change. And in that fashion, we identified uh, a population of vaccine-responsive peptides, which are depicted here, full changes on the y-axis and p-values, sorry, on the x-axis, p-values on the y-axis. You can see that these are dominated by these orange dots, which correspond to SARS-CoV-2 peptides. But there are a collection of peptides down in this, in this region here. Uh, that are designed from other species, from OC43, uh, 229E, and others. So initial evidence that there's some cross-reactivity, there's some induction of immunity against not only the, the vaccine target, SARS-CoV-2, but some other relatives within this viral family. This map shows where these vaccine responses against these linear peptides land within a, an alignment of the spike proteins. And so really they clustered into eight key epitope regions um, they're indicated by these um, vertical uh, pink stripes here. Four of them are in this S1 subunit, one in the N-terminal domain, um, three in, in these subdomains one and two. And then in, in this S2 subunit, we have one that's very just upstream of the, of the S2 prime cleavage site, another that's just downstream that's right in the fusion peptide region that, that sticks into the, the host membrane, and then a couple towards the C-terminus, uh, one in the stem helix, which we'll talk more about, and one in this heptad two repeat region. And of course, the fusion me um, machinery is, is, you know, resides in this S2 subunit. So that was interesting. Um, one thing you'll, you'll know pretty clearly here is that we see nothing in RBD, and, and this highlights one of the limitations, of course, of using linear peptides. We're not representing uh, three-dimensional conf conformational epitopes well. Um, nonetheless, we, we see some interesting things. So one thing you'll notice here is that I've also highlighted um, the position of reactivities that we, we observed in these related common cold coronaviruses. And so in OC43, we saw two regions lighting up, one corresponding to the fusion peptide and a second corresponding to the stem helix region. And for 229E and NL63, which are both alpha coronaviruses, we see reactivity at the fusion peptide. And in each of these um, cases, each of these four non-SARS-CoV-2 reactivities that, that are nonetheless vaccine-induced, we, we observe that this, these occur at regions of high sequence conservation uh, with SARS-CoV-2, which, which obviously makes sense given the, uh, that they appear to be a cross-reaction. So what do the kinetics of these look like? Um, I've now just taken, uh, really split these into two groups, uh, the, the six epitopes where there was no evidence of cross-reactivity, and then the two, FP and SH, fusion peptides, stem helix, where there is evidence of cross-reactivity. So for the first category where there are non-cross-reactive, we see this kind of progressive increase following vaccination starting at, at some baseline level and then increasing progressively to a maximum at day 140. Uh, in, in three of these cases, we see evidence of elevation at day 28. In no cases, however, do we see uh, any response by day eight in this assay against these epitopes. In contrast, when we look at these two cross-reactive regions, we see some interesting patterns. So what I've done here actually is to break out those 
those regions into the homologous peptides from SARS-CoV-2 in orange or the endemic relative OC43 in blue, uh, and, and basically track the evolution of those responses separately. And so you see these distinct kinetics where the SARS-CoV-2 peptides at these, at these sites, both the fusion peptide here and the stem helix epitope here. So in orange, these SARS-CoV-2 responses show that sort of progressive increasing pattern with time. In contrast, if you look at the homologues from OC43, they show this different pattern where they, um, they increase and then they taper off between day 28 and 140. And in the case of the stem helix epitope, uh, elevation is detectable as early as day eight uh, here, which was not evident for any of the SARS-CoV-2 epitopes. Um, so interesting sort of difference in the way the kinetics look. We, we looked, we looked um, just for completeness at, at full-length spike proteins, because of course we are looking at a subset of the epitope space here with these linear peptides. And there we see something similar where um, a robust response from a very low baseline against SARS-CoV-2 spike, as, as many others have described, and a subtle increase um, in reactivity to SARS, sorry, to OC43 uh, at day uh, 28, but then um, that diminishing by day 140. What I'm showing here in these in the middle here is, is the sequence conservation between these epitopes. You can see that they are uh, highly conserved, especially at, at particular core regions. And I'll, I'll zoom into that a little bit uh, deeper later in the talk as well. Okay, so another way of looking at these data is to integrate the response across the epitopes using, for example, principal components analysis and ask how a cluster, a subjects cluster over time. And we did that using PCA here on the left. I'm showing you an analysis using all of the epitopes that we identified and distinguishing day 0, 8, 28, and 140. And you can see that um, we can pretty clearly see that there's some um, differences with over time in these epitopes. You know, the, the response starting in red here in this very tight region, some evidence of a difference as early as day 8, and then with a clear um, evolution towards day 140. Interestingly, if we take the cross-reactive epitopes out of that analysis and just look at the, the unique SARS-CoV-2 reactive uh, epitopes, we lose the ability to distinguish day zero and day eight. So now the red and the green are completely uh, overlapping here. So just highlighting the point that there's some unique ability to detect the early response when we uh, factor in these cross-reactive common cold epitope regions. So given these distinctly evolving, but apparently cross-reactive responses, we next uh, sought to quantify the degree of, of cross-species reactivity over time. And, and to do this, we used a pretty simple depletion system where we put beads bearing peptides that had species-specific uh, sequences on them and asked the question of how depletion affected um, uh, the reactivity to other species, with the logic being if you deplete with a, with a peptide from one species and see a change in the signal from the peptide to, from another, it implies the existence of antibodies that are capable of, of cross-recognition of the two species. And so um, what I'm showing here is the reduction in reactivity to SARS-CoV-2 or OC43 peptides following depletion with bead-bound peptides that were either from SARS-CoV-2 in orange or in OC43 in blue. Uh, this in the top shows a non-cross-reactive epitope just showing that you really don't change anything when you deplete um, an irrelevant epitope. In contrast, um, when you deplete these two epitopes of interest, the fusion peptide and the stem helix, we see a reduction in signal basically across the board, across time, but one that's, that's basically uh, corresponding between the two species. In other words, uh, it doesn't matter what we deplete with for the most part or what we're detecting, the, the uh, reduction in signal is more or less equivalent. There is one exception to that pattern here at day 140. We see that um, we see a reduction, a greater reduction in SARS-CoV-2 reactivity of that epitope following depletion with that peptide pool than we see for the OC43 pool. So by and large, what we take away from this is the majority of this response represents a, a cross-reactive one where antibodies uh, recognize both SARS-CoV-2 and the endemic homolog. So we next sought to explore the trajectories of individual subjects and we developed this ratio metric that describes the relative strength of SARS-CoV-2 versus OC43 responses in individual subjects over time. Um, so higher on this scale means a response that's more focused on, on SARS-CoV-2 and lower means one that's more focused on the endemic virus. And we're just including subjects for each of these time points here that had 
detectable reactivity against either homolog above some, some threshold. And so what you'll see is this kind of progressive increase pattern, increasing pattern within individuals. Um, it's also interesting to note that in, in the few cases where we do see reactivity early on, even at, at baseline pre-vaccine, um, that reactivity tends, for the most part, to be focused on the endemic virus. And then, you know, with time, it, it, it focuses more on the, on the SARS-CoV-2 homologue. Uh, it's interesting that there is some distribution here. You know, it's not, uh, although, the, although the, the trend seems to be monotonously, monotonously increasing, uh, there is some, you know, some spread where some individuals are down here and others are up here. And it, it's, you know, we can speculate that this may relate to subject specific effects like stochastic VDJ uh, recombinant events in, in different individuals. So, what I've shown you so far indicates a uh, population of cross species reactive antibodies directed to these two epitopes, the fusion peptide and the stem helix epitope, but also that there is this capacity of the immune response to distinguish between the SARS-CoV-2 and the endemic versions of each of these epitopes. So to better understand what, what could be happening here, we used alanine scanning to find map the response of each of these regions. So each column here represents uh, an individual 30 mer peptide in which a single alanine was introduced to the focal position here. Um, from left to right in each of the 30 positions. And the coloring signal represents how um, significantly that alanine substitution disrupted uh, binding of, of that uh, or signal uh, against that epitope. What I'm also showing you here is an alignment of the sequences at the bottom where um, SARS-CoV-2 is shown on the top and then dots represent identities from the different endemic coronaviruses. And green letters are the ones where we have, where we observe complete sequence conservation. So the first thing you'll see is for each of these epitopes, there is a core region represented by the boxes and that that aligns very well with the most conserved substring within these epitopes. Uh, interestingly though, there is some evidence of diversion. So there, there are uh, of, um, of polymorphism. So there are um, residues that are not conserved, but nonetheless do seem to be important for binding. Uh, and those are indicated by the stars here. So these positions here, um, this position 1155 in the stem helix as well. Uh, and so the hypothesis then is that these are sites that can mediate the maturation of the response from an endemic focused one to SARS-CoV-2. So we tried to study that a little bit um, more finely using the alanine scanning approach and then and asking the question of how these responses, how these alanine uh, dependent signatures evolved with time between day 28 and day 140. So what I'm showing you on the left here is a comparison um, of day 28 on the x-axis, day 140 on the y-axis. Each dot is a different peptide reactivity. The gray dots are background. These are non-cove peptides. We just have the, the rest of the virum in there kind of coming along for the ride. Uh, and then we have a set of peptides that correspond to the stem helix epitope. And you can see that for both of these subjects, that, that set of peptides increases in reactivity between day 28 and day 140 pretty uniformly um, with a few really interesting exceptions. So so the wild-type peptide is shown in black, and the various alanine mutants are the, are the rest of these, these peptides here. And so for the most part, they, they sort of fall along this um, single trend line. But then there are a few exceptions, like um, these, these mutants here, where the, where the um, dependence uh, changes at day 140, and the ones down here as well. And so in situations where you see um, this kind of lower than expected reactivity at day 140 of the, of the mutant, that implies uh, a greater dependence of the response at day 140 on these positions, the, the phenylalanine at 1156 and the tyrosine at 1155. Um, and so we can aggregate that kind of analysis across multiple subjects and across um, all positions at both epitopes. Uh, and, and here I'm showing you these kind of dotted lines to, to, to indicate a, a sort of a variation, a variation interval based on uh, a large data set of, of irrelevant al alanine scan peptides just to show what um, kind of the 99% interval of, of expectation would be. And we can see a number of cases that fall outside of that interval, including in these polymorphic residues with the stars on them, indicating uh, evidence that there is some um, you know, evolution of specificity with the time at, this, at the amino acid level and that this does uh, overlap these polymorphic residues. So everything I've talked about so far has involved 
the analysis of these bulk polyclonal responses. We wanted to study this in, in finer detail and to sort of look at fu functional consequences as well. And so what we've begun is, is an antibody, um, monoclonal antibody isolation effort. These efforts are ongoing, but I just want to show you a slide or two of our initial results that look quite interesting. So we've implemented a, an approach that leverages um, the same kind of DNA barcoded system that I've described for the polyclonal analysis, but now applied to, to memory B cells using single cell sequencing. So we can take these libraries of DNA barcoded peptides uh, on the scale of hundreds to thousands. So we're doing this currently at sort of a 200-ish scale, but, the, but um, just like the previous assay, we think this is highly scalable. And then incubating these with a, a preparation of memory B cells, and then performing single cell sequencing, which allows us to, of course, using microfluidic approaches to associate the DNA barcodes on these antigens with the RNA sequences inside the memory B cells, particularly those encoding the heavy and light chain of the immunoglobulin receptor. So using that approach, I'll just show you one, uh, one uh, subject that we've studied so far. We took about 20,000 unsorted memory B cells, so not sorted for antigen specificity, and uh, applied this staining to them. And uh, here are the results. So I'm showing you just two out of the several hundred um, peptides that we had studied that we included in this multiplex panel. On the x-axis, I'm showing you the stem helix peptide from OC43, uh, and on the y-axis, the stem helix from SARS-CoV-2. So the majority of the cells are, are not binding to either of them, but we see two interesting cells, one here that is uh, appears to be monospecific for, for OC43, and a second that has um, dual specificity that, that recognizes both of these uh, peptide probes. So of course, we have the, the heavy light chain sequences from this data as well. We made the monoclonals <clears throat> and then did an initial test of neutralization capacity, in this case, uh, neutralizing the authentic SARS-CoV-2 virus in temperate negative VRV6 cells. Um, and the, uh, the, the monospecific non-SARS-CoV-2 specific uh, um, heavy light chain pair didn't show any evidence of neutralization in the system, whereas the one that was specific for both uh, showed the ability to neutralize SARS-CoV-2. While we were working on this, um, David Wiesler and colleagues described a very similar uh, monoclonal, a couple of monoclonals against the same epitope. And we, we included that one, one of those two, S2P6 in the synthesis. And uh, you can see the data point here in red, very similar. Um, neutralizing profile, at least at a single um, concentration that we tested. Interestingly, we don't get to 100% inhibition here. And um, in the Wiesler the study, they, they described um, that in, in temperance two positive cells, you, you, where the entry mechanism is, is sort of more restricted to the surface, uh, you can get up to 100% neutraliz neutralization with these specificities. <clears throat> and we think that the IC50, at least based on this, this um, uh, partial neutralization, is something in the sort of hundreds of nanogram per mil range, so sort of moderate potency. Okay, so just to, to wrap that up, I think we've shown that vaccination induces robust antibody responses to these various linear epitopes in spike, but also to others in, in conserved, conserved regions of, of endemic um, uh, coronaviruses. Um, the responses are dominated by cross-species reactive antibodies that we, we showed that from the bead depletion assay system. You see these interesting divergent kinetics between the SARS-CoV-2 and the endemic homologs that, that are consistent with clonal maturation. We, we are currently studying individual clones to see if we can see that at the individual clone level. Um, and as I showed you at the end there, we see this um, potential for neutralizing effect of these epitopes. Uh, not, not as potent, of course, as things directed to the RBD, but it seems that there may be some, um, some potential here. And you know, given the, the cross-species reactivity that we see at the peptide level, um, we haven't shown this yet, but we're, we're currently working on it. We expect that the neutralizing effect that we saw for, for, for SARS-CoV-2 would extend to, to other viruses like OC43, where there is conservation. So that leads us to, to the thought that you know, antibodies neutralizing broadly across the beta coronavirus genus um, may actually arise quite frequently. And, and the basis of that is, is you know, we see this stem helix reactivity in almost everybody post-vaccine, majority of people who are convalescent. Um, so this may, there may be some clues here for the development of a universal COVID vaccine. So just to pull this all together into a model, um, what we think is happening is that pre-SARS-CoV-2, there are reactivities against the S2 subunit of these endemic coronaviruses. These um, recognize with some affinity the SARS-CoV-2 spike, um, corresponding homologs, uh, epitopes, and then 
we, we hypothesize they mature by affinity maturation so that they no longer recognize the, the uh, endemic um, uh, epitopes predominantly, but now have a, uh, you know, an ability to recognize both the endemic and the pandemic flavors with, with good um, affinity. And that this leads to the development of these um, potentially broadly neutralizing antibodies of, of moderate potency. Okay, with that, I will pause and see what questions there are. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Alton. Really appreciate your talk. Um, a lot of interesting work went into that, so thank you so much. Um, we have some specific questions coming in for, for you. Um, the first is, which next generation sequencing assays were used for the library preparation? Yeah, let me skip back to this slide and see if I can help on that one. So this is the, hopefully, hopefully this is this is getting at the, the question, and if not, please correct me. This is the assay system where we, um, we, we order these, these large libraries of DNA barcodes, of, of DNA oligos, and then uh, use this in vitro preparation system to make the DNA barcode of peptides. And then for the next generation sequencing, we just used uh, NextSeq, you know, Illumina NextSeq platform um, sequencing. There, there's probably no reason it can't be extended to other sequencing platforms. You know, we, we need pretty short reads here. The accuracy is not super important given that we have a pretty defined library of templates, but we've been sticking with um, with Illumina next week as our sweet spot. Hopefully that was the question. Right, I think so, I think so. <laughs> um, and then maybe you could tell us why specifically was the amino acid alanine selected for the insertion? Yeah, we, we um, sort of just did what other people do in, in that we thought, um, given that it was a pretty simple, you know, uh, amino acid, just a, a methyl group, uh, it would be a way of, of knocking out interesting sort of function from each of these amino acids one at a time. Um, so yeah, there wasn't a lot of thought that went into that other than trying to disrupt what was happening at individual amino acids using alanine. Um, right, okay. Um, another question was, were there any phenotypic differences observed due to mutations? Let's see. So, I, I want if, if if this is asking about the alanine scan, um, that we we did we do this. Um, basically, we're doing this in, in the context of these linear peptides, uh, these libraries. So we're not looking necessarily at at, at viral phenotypes or anything of that sort. Right. Um, we're looking at the isolated peptide binders. Okay. So we do see differences in binding profiles, as I showed, but we're not looking at at viral um, phenotypes, if, if that's what the question was. I'm sorry, I may have missed the, the point of that one. Right, maybe I can get some clarification on that for you. Okay. Um, we have a question here, which is with reference to the comment on the development of pan beta coronavirus vaccines. Um, are you planning to evaluate other beta coronaviruses using this system that you've developed? Yeah, I think, I think it'd be quite interesting to look at, um, certainly in the first instance, look at neutralization across various others, you know, we, we started with OC43, but given the conservation that we see, um, you know, particularly for this stem helix epitope, but really for both, um, I think there is certainly potential here. And, and, and the, the paper from, from David Visa and colleagues that I mentioned shows mm -hmm. this nicely too, that there's conservation across the genus. And in fact, for this fusion peptide epitope, the conservation spans both alpha and uh, beta um, coronavirus gene right. genera. So we do think there's potential there. I, th I think it would be really interesting to, in the first instance, look at neutralization capacity of these individual clones against the various species. Uh, I think then the real challenge is how do you go from this observation of, of a, an epitope and, and a neutralization potential to a, a good rational design for a, a, a broadly neutralizing vaccine? Yeah. I that's <laughs> well, I, I can say that in the HIV field, they've been trying to do that for, for quite a while, you know, working back from, from some of the broadly neutralizing antibodies. So what are, I guess, in terms of, you know, the development of a universal coronavirus vaccine, um, how, how do we work backwards from that epitope to get there? What is your outlook for that, for the prospects for that? Yeah, well, maybe it's a pessimistic um, approach or pessimistic view, but one, one observation here is that we know that these antibodies arise, uh, at least we know that the antibodies arise against these epitopes almost universally following the, the standard mRNA vaccines that we've looked at. And we know that they, at least in the few cases we've looked at so far, they can be neutralizing. So 
I guess that's good and bad. The, 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 the negative side of that is, well, we know we're already getting them and yet, um, I guess we don't know how broadly we are neutralizing coronaviruses with these vaccine responses. Maybe we're doing better than we think. And certainly one of the hypotheses here is that vaccination against SARS-CoV-2 may be protective to some degree against these relatives as well. And I think that remains to be to be de determined. So, so that's there's some potential there. I guess what we have to think about is ways of, if, if this is the right strategy, of ways of focusing the response, perhaps a booster that that takes that sort of baseline response that we get across the whole thing and then you know, using some sort of construct uh, targets in on these conserved epitopes, uh, there's some potential that, that that sort of strategy could be a way of doing this. I think I think the affinity of these responses and that sort of the IC50s that we see are, are, are modest, so that there's there's sort of a need I think to to go after ways of improving the affinity of these sites if we think that's going to be the, the strategy. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's a lot to think about there. I think you're right to say that the the, uh, the HIV field I, I think is, is both positive and negative in terms of you know, what, what, what to do with, with broadly neutralizing antibodies. But, um, you know, we're so early on, I think, in, in, the, in the process here that I think there's a lot of things to explore. Yeah, right, absolutely. Well, we've seen that inducing any immunity against SARS-CoV-2 is much easier than HIV. So <laughs> that's a, one thing in, uh, that works in its favor. Um, we have a question on whether you could comment on the potential extra neutralization mechanisms of these cross-reactive antibodies. Yeah, um, so I, I think that the theory as to why these are certainly taking the SH as an example, the stem helix here, the theory as to why this is neutralizing, I think, is that uh, it, it would disrupt in some way the ability of the, of the spike protein to do its job and to, to mediate fusion between membranes. ACE2 um, or RBD binding antibodies are expected to disrupt, you know, the initial recognition event. Uh, of course, these occur, you know, these, this is the stalk, the lower part of the, of the protein. So the mechanism that, that I don't know that, you know, how well this has been really described yet, but I think the mechanism that makes sense given the first principles would be that this is disrupting uh, the fusion apparatus and the ability to bring the membranes together post recognition of ACE2. Right, okay, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a question on if there is any drawback to not pre-enriching the probed B cells for the single cell sequencing. Uh, the majority of sequencing B cells will not be reacted to any probe in the current setup. So how good is the specificity and sensitivity of this approach? Yeah, it's a great question. It's one that we've thought about too in this sort of technical sense. Um, I think the, the advantage is that you, what we're struggling with and, and anyone in our lab will tell you this is, is just getting enough cells you know you, you always struggle to get these are rare obviously rare events so so if we can omit a sorting step um we found that that can help you know with cell recovery so that's that's the that's the motivation for not sorting um in terms of the drawback i, th I think what what seems to be the case with this with this kind of staining is that because we're looking at so many probes and we have this very nice high sensitivity dna readout that even with this whole lot of non-relevant b cells in there um, we do see, as, as you can see on this slide, quite a nice a dynamic range for staining. And, and so far, um, close to 50% of, of cells that have stained in this fashion, taken from unsorted cells, just, just memory cells, have ended up panning out, binding to what they, what they look like they're bound to in the single cell data. So I think it's true that there is a, a potentially a specificity um, question there, and it's, I'm sure it's going to be less specific, slightly less specific than if we were to sort, to pre-sort the cells. But it seems that the uh, the advantage of being able to do this without the cell losses that we saw with sorting um, uh, outweigh the, the potential you know, reduction in specificity. Right, right. So we have a, a, an overarching question on whether you can provide a perspective on the broader potential of the pep peptide sequence platform. For example, on identification of population-based surveys of potential viral linkages with autoimmune disease or neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah, definitely an area that we're, we're interested in. And there was some really nice work recently that, that you may have seen where um, the association between EBV and multiple sclerosis was really nicely teased out using this kind of approach, longitudinal survey. So we have um, work ongoing in that kind of space. We think there's a lot of potential there. One of the things that we've been really interested in, and I haven't shown any of it here, but it is to, to use this kind of viral wide view in combination with longitudinal sampling uh, to to see you know, what viral events we can infer over time and potentially you know, with, with the right kind of cohorts, correlate that with 
various um, inflammatory autoimmune disease outcomes. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, the other thing that we've done, I think that will help to accelerate this, this kind of direction is to lower the, the sort of barrier to sampling. So we've actually developed dried blood spot approaches where we can you know, essentially democratize the, the collection of samples, get citizen scientists involved here um, to, to collect self blood, blood spots and still you know, perform very well in these kinds of assays. So I agree with that question that there's a lot of, of potential there and one that, you know, something we were interested in pursuing. Right, right. So have monoclonal antibodies targeting the fusion peptide of SARS-CoV-2 been described before? Uh, they haven't. Uh, there have been a few that have, there was, there was a paper recently I think that described them uh, in a feline system, but I haven't, I'm not aware of, of, um, of work describing the fusion, uh, monoclonals against the fusion peptide. Okay. There may be something out there. I mean, I think it's such a fast moving field, but. Yeah, yeah. So we have a, a question and a comment, which was, you know, any single B cells with the reactivity to the fusion peptide. And um, could this be a similar mechanism as neutralization to HIV-1 by fusion peptide antibodies? Yeah, I think that's that's a great hypothesis. I mean, even for influenza, there are okay. you know, broad neutralizing monoclonals directed to the fusion peptide region. Um, so it seems like a good target to be going after. Uh, and of course, the, what we see, you know, based on these conservation analyses uh, is that not only would we be expecting an effect against, um, against the beta coronaviruses, but the conservation here is right across the, the family, or at least across these two genera. So uh, it may be even broader in, in, in its um, breadth than, than the uh, stem helix specificity. And so then we had uh, someone asking if you could highlight any challenges you experienced during the library preparation and how one can avoid them. Yeah, we, we've got this um, this library system down to a pretty fine art at this point. I mean, it's it, it's a sort of a two week process. Typically, um, we we have a, a manuscript describing this protocol that's that's uh, under review. So hopefully, we can sort of get get this um, out to the field pretty soon. But it's. Um, it's it's pretty robust in as much as it is fully in vitro, as I mentioned. So it's a series of enzymatic steps. It doesn't require cells. Um, I think the the other thing is that because we're dealing with peptides and we sort of have fixed lengths, we can use some very nice QCs. We can see how things are synthesizing very very easily. So I think uh, probably the step that's most prone to failure, although we, we haven't had it fail for a while now. Has been the translation step. So you're, you know, you're taking your RNA templates and treating them with, with a, a complex mixture um, of in vitro translation reaction uh, reagents. And so sometimes uh, getting an efficient translation and then purifying that product from the whole soup of, of the translation mixture can be a challenge. Um, but I think uh, it's it's been working pretty well for us at least so far. Okay, wonderful. Well, we'll make sure that that paper gets shared with our audience. We appreciate that. And then I guess just a last question for you. So what's next? What are you, how are you planning to move forward? Yeah, I think uh, deeper characterization of some of these monoclonals, um, especially studying the, the sort of evolution of sequence specificity. So we have uh, samples collected, you know, pre-vaccine here for these subjects. And I think the ability to look at how uh, the antibody sequences evolve, you know, with the hypothesis that there are these pre-existing clones that were raised, you know, against the endemic coronaviruses and then got recruited into this response and then mutated and matured their specificity towards SARS-CoV-2. Uh, that's, that's a direction that we're interested in exploring using the same kind of single cell as well as deep uh, BCR sequencing based approaches. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Alton, for presenting on all this really exciting research and um, for taking time to obviously answer questions from our audience. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll take back here the sharing of the screen. Thank you. And thank you to, to all of the attendees for participating in today's webinar and for submitting such great questions for our speaker. Uh, we're always so thrilled to have such an engaged audience for the lab meetings. And with that, I'd like to invite you to join us two weeks from today, which is on April 7th. And our speaker that day will be Dr. John Sang, Chief of the Multi-Scale Systems Biology Section and Co-Director of the Center for Human Immunology 
at the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He will present on using influenza vaccination and systems immunology to probe immune imprints associated with prior mild COVID-19. And if you're interested in more research on COVID-19, please sign up for the HVP COVID Report, a bi-weekly newsletter that provides insights from experts around the globe and highlights the latest scientific articles and data. And finally, please visit our website and follow us on LinkedIn where the full webinar series is available. And with that, I'll say thank you again for participating today. Stay safe and we hope that you'll join us again in two weeks for the next Global COVID Lab meeting. Thank you so much.